Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the last day of April and Friday afternoon at the manor. And here we are. It's hard to imagine that it's the, April is coming to a rapid close. And then May is just around the corner. And the, the, the old proverb of uh, March winds and April showers bring forth May flowers. Well, we're getting lots of showers. We'll see if they end in May. Probably not. But Susan, as our okay. wonderful person, cap, cap, captain, captain, our captain, over to you. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming today. We're welcoming back, welcoming back Kelly Snow, who is uh, at the Department of Human Geography uh, at the University of Toronto. And he's got uh, another message for us about the environment and what we can do to help it. So, Kelly. Thank you, uh, Susan. Um, okay, I'm actually uh, going to talk, I'm going to give a lecture or I'm going to give a presentation that I give to uh, my students um, in a course I teach on um, climate, on, on environmental planning. Because uh, do, do you want me to make a co-host, Kelly? Yeah, I'm going to need to share a screen. Okay, so I made you co-host and then you can share a screen. Good. Okay, so I have a presentation for you guys that I give to my students uh, when we uh, introduce the, the issue of climate change. And um, it's really not what, it's, it's, it's really just, um, um, it's a lecture with a few lectures behind it. So I'll skip through some of the beginning stuff I can get to how um, climate change is affecting Toronto directly. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but first of all, I should say that I have a hard stop at 20, at 2.20, okay, because I have to go pick up Bella at 2.30 and she's a few minutes away. So, um, so we can start and I'm going to share my screen with you. Can you guys see my screen? Perfect. Okay, so this is what the topic is uh, today, this afternoon. Um, and as I said, I give this lecture um, uh, or presentation uh, at the beginning of when we start to consider climate change in the environmental planning course I teach at U of T Scarborough. And so um, I guess we can just get started. Now, as many of you are aware, um, our wet, oops, our weather. Hang on a sec. Our weather is changing. Okay, so um, and how is this going to be affecting Toronto? Uh, well, we can expect in summary uh, hotter, drier summers and extreme rainfall events. And I'm going to get to that exactly how it's playing out thus far in this um, in this uh, I guess environmental process. Um, but basically, we're talking about uh, climate change uh, due to the release of greenhouse gases or CO2 uh, by human activities. That's the important thing. It's, it's a, these are human generated activities, primarily through the use and, and burning of fossil fuels. And uh, here's an interesting slide. This is from, this is from 2018, I believe. And this is the Greenland ice cap, um, the largest, if not one of the largest um, in, in the world. And you can see that um, as of July 12th, at least almost 100% of the surface of this ice cap had started to melt. Okay, and so this is just an indication of something that's uh, changing because that's the, that's the image on the right. And on the left, we've got something taken about 30 years ago. So you can see there's definitely something uh, changing. Um, so what can this, uh, what can we anticipate uh, due to these changes that are happening? Well, we can anticipate changes in rainfall and, uh, and these are gonna come in the form of um, less snow and more rain in the winter, uh, more rain in July and about 80% more and in August, about 50%. Um, 
extreme daily rainfall. We can expect around fewer, fewer rainstorms with greater than 25 millimeters in winter and the same number of storms in the summer, but it's the intensity that's the difference. And I'm gonna uh, get into that in a, in a few minutes. And then we have a couple of graphs here that demonstrate um, change in temperatures over time um, in, and in rainfall and in snowfall. Okay, so um, again, in some less snow, more rain in winter, more rain in July and August, and uh, they're gonna be much more intense events. Warmer temperatures, we can anticipate a warmth change in about four degrees average uh, by 2040, which is uh, less than 20 years away. Um, uh, we can expect an, a, an annual in temperature increase by 4.4. Uh, the winter will increase by about 5.7 Celsius degrees and the average summer temperature will in increase by 3.8. Uh, Extreme daily minimum temperatures are less cold by 13 degrees. So if it's, if uh, the average in uh, January uh, used to be minus 20, it's now gonna be about minus seven, okay? Um, extreme daily maximum temperatures become warmer by 7.6 degrees. So these are just stats that really are just, you know, numbers and, and so on. And we'll get to the, how it actually affects us in a few minutes. So here's some number of hot days. These are days that are uh, considered uh, dangerous for to, by public health. So we've got uh, uh, between six, 1961, 1990, we had around less than 20 a year. Um, we are currently looking at around uh, 20, 25 uh, hot days or over 30 degrees. Um, if you look at 2020 to 2040, so we're already in that range. And um, coming up uh, by 2080, we're going to be looking at over almost 70 hot days a year, over 30 degrees. So this is an extreme change in our, um, in our climate over a very short amount of time in terms of uh, geological time. Okay, so we're looking at a, a shift in... Uh, a two degree shift in uh, temperature in terms of becoming warmer. We're looking at extreme hot days increasing by about three, per, um, three, three times, if you look at this graph. So what are the impacts on Toronto uh, itself? So more extreme uh, weather impact, weather events results in heavy rain, flash floods, high winds, freezing rain, so on, tornadoes even. And there's damage to building um, sewer and transportation infrastructure, electrical systems, and so on, which cause blackouts, which are dangerous and um, very uh, it's difficult to, to, to manage, especially in times like we're experiencing now. And we're not only talking about um, uh, events in the summer, we're also talking about events like the, uh, the ice storm that occurred a few years ago. I think that was 2014. Um, uh, things like that. So there'd be odd sort of things that occur uh, more frequently. And we're talking about uh, climate, which is different than weather, because weather is what's happening outside right now, but climate is something that happens over time, like on a, a consistent basis. So there's a difference between weather and, and climate. Um, this uh, is going to result. The change in temperature is going to result in um, many different, um, many different things. Uh, our ecosystems will um, be changing, which will result in increased stress to uh, vulnerable ecosystems, trees, and so on. So you can see there's damage to homes, um, disease vectors such as mosquitoes and black-legged ticks will become more frequent. Um, they'll, their their uh, season will become longer and they will, um, they will uh, become more of a problem. This will also enable um, species that have not previously been in this region to move into it, if it as it warms. And these ecosystems, they're, they're set up with defense mechanisms that often deal with um, harmful uh, pests and so on in their own system as it changes as something 
say, moves north as the temperature increases, the um, defense mechanisms are not as strong or they're not the same as they were in areas where um, these pests or um, uh, other things such as that uh, are more prevalent because they've been there for so, so, so much longer, right? So we're talking about a very rapid change in, in uh, ecosystems that are not necessarily um, designed to do that, to deal with it. A good example of this, of course, is the, is the black-legged tick, the vector of, the, of Lyme disease. You can see the uh, increasing northern range that it will uh, that we will experience, and this will become um, more and more of a public health issue as more people are who are not necessarily used to dealing with the threat of uh, Lyme disease and black-legged ticks uh, as it moves north and, and encounters more po different populations that it hasn't uh, encountered in the past. So. In terms of um, changes in our climate, what can we anticipate as far as impacts in Toronto? So uh, we can expect more heat waves, um, smog days related, related illnesses and deaths. So there's, it's multifaceted. There's uh, um, uh, pollution, there's health issues, uh, of course, stress on electrical systems um, and declining lake le levels, which is a little counterintuitive as to what's happened lately, which I'm gonna talk about, but we can expect over time, in general, declining lake levels. Okay, so smog days have really reduced though, I should point that out since we've stopped burning coal in Ontario. And, um, but there are moments uh, or times that I will show uh, where this is an issue. Um, particular matter. So how does this affect uh, vulnerable populations? So heat is very, very dangerous to people who are homeless, um, low income, have poor housing conditions, who have uh, limited mobility. Of course, um, lack of insurance. Um, people who are have a lack of insurance or savings are also are very vulnerable to heat if they don't have proper housing and so on. And this, of course, includes isolated seniors, um, and infants and small children. Okay. Now, one of the things I should point out, and before I say my talk about my next slide, is that I'm teaching planning students, and so we talk a lot about buildings and so on. And so, buildings uh, are a big part of these courses and learning about how buildings impact the environment. And so, here's just a quick summary, a, a slide here. Um, buildings account for about 50% of the use of natural resources, about 52% of total water consumption. This is the construction, um, operation, and um, general life of the building. Um, these, when a building comes down, often it ends up in landfills. Um, there's millions of tons of waste on an annual basis, and they also release a lot of greenhouse gas. Okay. So um, this is mitigated in Toronto by uh, good transit use, at least pre-pandemic times. And um, about 30% of Toronto's uh, greenhouse gas emissions result from operating buildings. And so it's important that there are ways of um, making buildings more sustainable, which is something that we talk about. So let's look at a couple of examples, uh, some of which you guys will be familiar with in terms of um, overall changes in our climate. Um, we can think about uh, last summer, uh, 2020, uh, when essentially uh, wildfires were consuming California, Oregon, and in Washington. And so this was something that was uh, so significant that you could see it from space. You can see here the, uh, the plume that is out over the Pacific. That's huge, huge cloud. And that's smoke from burning fires. And in a way, it's good it's going over the ocean because if it goes the other way like this, um, we're looking at it impacting us. And this is taken, this is an image taken from last summer from Toronto Islands during the wildfires in California. So you can see it looks like a really, really heavy smog day. But this is, this is particulate matter from the burning forests in California, Oregon. 
in Washington. Okay, so the next example we'll talk about, fall 2019, um, when our, oops, when the land down under was essentially on fire. So um, this was extremely tragic, about a billion animals lost their lives. Uh, here's a couple of images that are pretty sad, koala bears and so on. So the impact is of course on humans, but it's also really impacting the biodiversity and um, the, the and nature in general, like the human, you know, emissions, human generated emissions of CO2 causing changes in climate, which is directly affecting um, many, many species. Uh, spring 2017, a couple of years before that, we had uh, extreme flooding on the islands. I don't know if you remember. Um, again, a little counterintuitive to the overall general change in climate resulting in lower lake levels, but the increased unseasonal rain at the time caused this um, caused the the, the, the the lake to actually rise, and um, which was something that hasn't happened in a long, long time. Okay, May 2016. Um, this is five years ago already. Um, I have a lot of uh, family in Alberta, so this was kind of an important event. Um, uh, lightning strikes in the, in the ignited a fire in the in the Canadian boreal boreal forest around Fort McMurray. Uh, Alberta and started one of the largest wildfires um, we've ever seen in, in Canada. Now, when you're talking about planning, it's an interesting, it's important to keep in mind that there are different, um, when we're planning our communities and we're planning for climate change, we have to look at these things that, um, that we call the interface and the intermix. So there's the wild urban interface, which is where the built form or human built communities actually bump up against, um, let's say nature or, or the forest, or, or the, in this case, the boreal forest. And then there's an intermix where houses are right in the middle of it. So there's a difference. Um, and you have to plan differently for each context. It's not like in some cases, it's hard to imagine exactly what you could do to, to uh, plan for something like this, but um, um, it, it, there are options and I'll, sh I'll talk briefly about those. Um, as we know, Fort McMurray was completely evacuated. It was uh, just an incredible sight to see everyone leaving. It was very, I mean, there was fire right on the side of the road. Um, this uh, is interesting. Um, in these wildfires, they create their own microclimate. And you can see this image here, which is, a, which is a photograph. And here's a rendering of something very similar. Now, what happens is the ground becomes positively charged, the cloud becomes negatively charged, and then above the negative charges are, again, positive charges. And so as it moves, as it moves, which is due to the heat underneath it, it's moving forward, it's creating a, ch a charge which result in lightning strikes, which basically causes the fire to grow and causes more fire to ignite in front of it. And so this thing is a self-perpetuating monster. Um, and, and these things that are, that are occurring in California, Australia, and in Canada are due to um, drier, less rainfall and um, drier conditions and so on. So here we have an example. This is the Fort McMurray fire. This is the, the interface, you would call it here. And um, behind it, I believe, would be in more of an intermix. Here's another map. You can see this is when the fire was actually in the town, in the city. And, um, and you can see this is a real interesting. This is a good case of a urban um, a, a wild inter, inter so it's meeting the forest, it's not necessarily integrated into it. Okay, so that's our last uh, image of Fort McMurray, but, but, oh no. It seems... Um... <laughs> Are you guys just getting a blank screen? Yeah. Yes, yes. 
Okay. Um, Did the um, pre presentation go to the Twilight Zone? Or? It's it's this is a PDF that I'm sharing with the screen with. So I don't think the PDF loaded properly. So what okay. I'll do is I'm going to close it. Okay. Uh, just wait. Just hang tough. We'll, and pause then, for, um, we'll, we'll pause for station identification. Okay. And then I will open it up again. Yes. Well, it's good you know you know to do that. I'm sure you had this journey before. This is fascinating, Kelly. Oh my. <laughs> Thank you. Can you guys still still see my screen? We can still see your screen. Yes. And you see it, you can see the presentation again. We can see March the 2nd. Oh, you did what? <laughs> March the 2nd, 2021. We see yeah. our weather is changing. Yeah. Okay, so you see the screen. You yeah. see the you see the slide. Okay. Yes. Let me see if it's open, if it's opened all the way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, so here we were. Um, this is an image of Fort McMurray. I thought it's particularly poignant of a playground. Uh, the damage in the city was incredible, and it was it, it was actually, I think, a miracle that no one lost their lives. Anyway, um, so here's what we can do in terms of planning. Like there are things that you can do in terms of planning your build form or or or, or planning neighborhoods and so on that can help reduce the damage uh, to to these, um, which which will help adapt communities to climate change that won't necessarily mitigate the causes of it but it will certainly adapt adapt our communities which i think is in terms of communities in the north in the boreal forest these are things that are going to have to be considered um, this is a good this is a good one um, you can there's many different ways that you can uh, um, manage this uh, threat um, not necessarily saying that they're going to all be um, effective but um, uh, there, there are there are different things. So you can do it through landscaping, watershed management plans, forest management plans. These are not necessarily urban planning uh, areas of, of responsibility, but they certainly would pr be provincial provincially. There's building codes, how you build buildings, so the the um, uh, materials what is that, that are used um, can be um, uh, sensitive to the pressures of climate change. Um, you can talk about land use and development codes, something that I work on. Um, subdivision, subdivision design standards, maybe distance separation distances, um, and so on. And then, of course, local governments need to, you know, work with uh, by using um, bylaws and, and and so on to help control and mitigate some of these uh, threats through land use. So these would be land use control instruments that could be used to help mitigate. And I'm sure that. In Fort McMurray, they must have thought of, of this at some point. I just don't think that the intensity and scale was what was anticipated. And so that's probably what took everyone by surprise. Like the, the, the speed in which the fire came, the, the intensity and size of it, like the, the way it was just um, so, so big so quickly. And then as I, and as I mentioned, it becomes a self-perpetuating um, um, machine it becomes a monster that you can't control. It's, it almost becomes alive like and I think uh, forest firefighters um, talk about it like that it becomes almost like a beast that's that you have to like fight so um, that's uh, wildfires the threat of wildfires we talk about that in in uh, the course I teach in, in uh, environmental planning as becoming an increasing threat to communities in in like all over the world as we as we mentioned but uh, we'll look at a couple of examples now that are specific to Toronto that I'm sure you guys will remember. Let's begin with uh, July the 8th, 2013. It's hard to believe it's like eight years ago almost. Um, but this is Toronto on that afternoon. I was working in Metro Hall on the 22nd floor uh, where I, I had, had been for, for quite some time. And uh, it was, I think it was around three o'clock 
I forget, but it was like suddenly it got extremely dark. I don't know if you guys recall this, but it was this storm rolled in. And the I don't know if you can see on your screens, but the sky became almost greenish. And um, so this is Toronto uh, on July 8th, 2013. Um, We've got a few here. This one I think was taken from my office window and you can see the storm front. It was actually like a giant, you know, those movies when the alien enormous ship rolls over the city. That's what it was like. Okay, so it became darker and darker and more and more surreal. Okay, and and we'll talk about uh, this it, it, and it poured an immense amount of rain. Okay. I've got a few images just showing that, which are just, in a way, they're just spectacular because it was coming down like unbelievable. And then, of course, you know, we all had to try and get home and this is what it looked like. <laughs> so um, I, I think you guys probably re recall, like, I mean, if any of you were, were out, maybe we can talk about that. But I was downtown and I had to get home and um, which is up here. And uh, I tell you, I, I it took me a long time. <laughs> Here's Union Station. Okay. Um, this is under Simcoe. I don't know if you recall that. Okay. And here's just a few images. Now, what happens is there's so much pressure. If you look to the left there, the top left, if you look, uh, there's so much pressure on the, on the uh, stormwater pipes that these, uh, I guess, manhole covers that are called, they're, they're either steel and they're meant to be so heavy that you can't pick them up because they don't want people going down there but the water was blast you can blast them right off you know it's what the pressure can just take them right off from there and so you can see that was a famous image on the bottom right i think that's a ferrari a poor guy <laughs> he's trying to get home i think that's underneath simcoe okay and here's uh, some images from pretty close by down in the valley this is Bayview's just to the right. This is looking south, and this is uh, Don Valley. Okay, and people were stuck on there for about four hours, right? Snakes on a train. See that? It's a water snake coming in. And so um, I had a colleague of mine. She was stuck on this train, this exact train, for four hours. She was on her way home. She got caught. And then finally they got him off. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, so that was one example of an extreme rain event that occurred, that has occurred in Toronto that, uh, that uh, was uh, quite memorable. And, and let's talk about uh, August 19th, 2005, um, which is a, probably one of the most interesting examples of this um, in terms of images, because we were able to capture some that are really uh, quite important to, to illustrate what we're dealing with. So this was the same sort of thing, the, the sky darkened. This, these are photos from North York. Um, the sky darkened and suddenly started pouring rain, like, in, like just unbelievable amounts of rain. So I again was working downtown at Metro Hall that day. And I can remember, this is kind of funny. Um, I was just about to, to leave and um, I was gonna go meet some friends of mine after work and uh so i took i quickly took the elevator down I, I left and i took the elevator down and um as i was in the elevator i was like oh i gotta walk to this uh i gotta walk over to this pub i wish i had gone to the washroom beforehand and so just as i got out of the elevator um the uh like the power cut <laughs> And so I was imagining that it was quite possible that I could have been caught in this elevator for like a couple of days. But anyway, um, so rain started coming down like crazy. This is, as I said, North York. And um, it was, again, very, very intense. There was uh, water in the roads. The sewer system, the stormwater systems could not deal with it. Okay, and so cars were getting stranded. They were getting stuck, breaking, like, uh, stalling in the, in the water. Water was coming into basements, the immense amounts, and it was also putting a huge amount of pressure on our on our infrastructure. So this is the Finch, this is Black Creek, and this is Finch, um, and uh, 
you can see that there's, uh, this is the ravine here, and there's maybe a billion uh, tons of water <laughs> backed up and trying to get through this culvert here to get to underneath Finch to the other side. So you can see that it's causing some damage here. It's buckling. The police already have it taped off. Um, it's getting more and more serious. This is taken from a series of photographs that were taken from an apartment building that was just adjacent looking down. And you can see that it just started to, the pressure was too much. And then the water, it became completely uh, un uncontrollable as the water began to like this. It's all backed up up here, right? And it has nowhere to go. So it's going to keep coming down. It's, and uh, it did, it kept coming down more and more and more and more. And then the infrastructure collapsed. So this is the culvert and it completely collapsed. It could not handle it, the pressure. Just think of the amount of weight that's on this thing. And so it totally blasted through and, and took out this portion of Finch. I think probably some of you recall this. Um, and this, can, this is, uh, in, in illustrates the type of pressure that our infrastructure will be under on a more frequent basis. And then it's important to remember that the city was not built to deal with these kinds of, of rain events. And so our infrastructure is not really designed to handle these, um, this kind of capacity. And so here's the damage. Here's all the different types of uh, infrastructure that were affected, pathways, uh, cables, basic maintenance holes, water mains, gas mains, all of these different types of things that people that we depend on to in our daily lives, right? So this was an, an event that that affected them all. And so here's an actual photo of it down in the ravine. And here is an image of what they built uh, to replace it. So it's much larger culvert. You can see probably twice, maybe three times the size. And it has a spill over here that to handle more water if there's pressure. Um, if, the, if this culvert can't handle it all. So it can start coming through here as well. So it's sort of like an overflow valve. So this is what they did in order to deal with these types. So they, they did this after quite a bit of study and they were able to come up with this design here that is uh, apparently supposedly going to be quite effective uh, in case if this ever were to happen again. But of course it won't damage, it won't happen here. It'll happen just <laughs> where there isn't a culvert like this. So what, um, let's look at this as an example as to the, 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 the cost to this. Okay, so let's take a look here. 2005 storm, um, $4 million to rebuild one culvert. Okay, $3 million to help people who were uninsured. There's $40 million to um, repair to repair other city infrastructure that were damaged. So, forty-seven million dollars to the cost of to the to the city of Toronto for one single storm event. Okay. In addition to that, um, we had auto co commercial like automobile insurance uh, was around three hundred million payouts. So all of those, you know, prepared and so on. And then the sewer backup payouts. Now, this is related to when the sanitary sewer system, it, the, the, the stormwater system flows into it and causes backups. This is the old system in Toronto. It's combined. It's called combined. So on one side, it's like a W. And then on one side is the, the sanitary system uh, where the, you call it the brown water uh, goes. And then on the other side, the other groove is, this, is, the, is the storm water. And so that's where the storm water um, pours into. Now, when an event like that happens, as you can see, it, it, it'll overflow the storm side and it will flow into the sanitary side and it mixes everything up. And then the water can't go anywhere as we saw from the images from Finch there, and it starts to back up. And for, I don't know if those, if any of you have ever had this happen, but what happens is those drains in the, on, in your basement, um, like 
water, combined water from the, from the storm and sanitary sewer systems starts to flow into your basement and it flows up and up, up. And it's just, it's like putrid. It's disgusting. So anything you have down there is, is destroyed. It's like, you know, you can't clean it. And so $300 million in sewer backup payouts. So it's a pretty expensive event. Okay. Now, um, what everyone likes to do or should do, I think, is compare this to what is known here in Toronto as the storm of the century, which would have been Hurricane Hazel. Of course, happened in 1954, October, uh, October of 1954. Basically, uh, a hurricane tracked up the coast of, uh, of the United States, moved inland and parked itself over top of Toronto. Okay, now Toronto had, um, had had rain for two or three weeks before this, and so the ground was saturated, and there wasn't much um, planning in terms of uh, floodplains, uh, like understanding floodplains, and so on. And so uh, there was a lot of people that lived in ravines, and basically because of the saturated um, uh, ground, uh, due to the previous rainfall, the amount of rain that fell, which was ultimately 285 millimeters in just 48 hours, um, had to flow down, flowed over the streets into the ravines. It washed houses away. It caused an immense amount of damage. And um, 81 people lost their lives. Um, 32 houses were washed away. Um, 4,000 people were left homeless. And in today's dollars, it was about a billion dollars of damage. So this is one storm uh, in 1954 over 48 hours, which really is the benchmark for what we should be comparing the use of our, how we design our infrastructure and so on and, and plan our cities. And so we've been doing this for a long time, planning for these kinds of events. And that's why there's no development in ravines. And we're trying to anticipate, we're trying to uh, maximize Softscaping and, and reducing hard services and so on, but still, um, it, it was a it was a really really significant rain event. And just to put it into perspective a little bit, it says 300 million tons of water fell during that storm, and that's equivalent to all of the water going over Horseshoe Falls here in one and a half days. So I know you've all seen Niagara Falls, and it's actually a little mind blowing how much water keeps continually flowing over that those waterfalls, and it just sort of it's just you know it's just, where is this water coming from, <laughs> right? So it's, it helps you understand how much water um, fell during that storm, that one storm in 1954. Now here's where things I think, in my opinion, get really interesting. Okay, which illustrate changes in, in, in our climate. Now you can see on the left uh, at the top, um, 285 millimeters of rain fell over 48 hours. Okay. In, on July 8th, 2013, we had 126 millimeters of rain. And then on August 19th in 2005, we had 122 millimeters of rain. But if you look over to the right, the, the circle graph, in, on July 8th, 2013, 126 millimeters fell in six hours. Okay, so it's much, much more intense, probably to like a factor of five or six, right, and compared to Hurricane Hazel. And then you look at uh, a more extreme uh, example, and that was August 19th. And you can see that 122 millimeters fell in one hour. Okay, so we're talking about extremely intense uh, rain events, which are modeled to become more frequent. And so we have to plan our cities um, better um, to deal with this. And that's, um, there's one last uh, graph that just shows um, typical rainfall about the last highest amount of rainfall on July 8th 20, uh, was in 2008, and that was 29, almost 30 centimeters. So much, much, much less. Um, so uh, I usually go through this with my students. I'll go through it quickly. 
Uh, so what is the city of Toronto doing in order? In other words, what can we do to plan our cities? How can we plan our cities um, more effectively to deal with this? And so there's different um, actions, there's different types of actions that, that um, can be used to, to, to deal with, to combat climate change, if you want to use those words, mitigation adaptation. So you try and reduce and mitig mitigation, you try and reduce uh, the effects of climate change by reducing the re release of carbon. And that's uh, what Paris and, and all the other agreements are, are about. But then there's also adaptation, which is building our cities in a way that are going to deal with um, this um, changing climate. And so what is Toronto doing? These are examples of it, um, different types. Some, there's overlap. It's, 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 it's a Venn diagram. Um, oh, ahead of the storm. This is a document that the city put out back in 2008. It's been updated since. This is just uh, an older cover. Um, uh, many different uh, city divisions are responsible. And um, this is actually part of the, of the problem with, um, with dealing with climate change is that our bureaucracies were designed to deal with issues that uh, they weren't facing back then. Um, climate change, biodiversity loss, and so on. And so they're, there's, they're put into silos when coordination is really something um, that needs to, needs to occur. Now, there's ob obviously the city's getting much better at it, but there are, it is sometimes different, difficult to um, transcend the different uh, responsibilities of these, I'll call them silos, because you can see on the right, the names of all the different divisions or, or, or agencies that are responsible for, um, for different areas of city, city building and city management. Here's something that's interesting that public health did in terms of um, overlaying uh, um, rental units with buildings higher than uh, less than five stories or higher than five stories. Um, you can see that there's concentrations of them and then they created a vulnerability index due based on census tract uh, income. And so you can see that uh, these uh, are areas where public health makes an effort during heat waves to go and check on people. Now, bringing this to present day, um, uh, our current situations, I, I bet, now I haven't done this, but I bet that we could overlay a map of uh, hotspots in Toronto and it would probably uh, reflect the same same information because this is where people who are low income tend to be seniors, newcomers, um, uh, and, and, and so on in lots of large rental units um, and so on where, where rates of transmission are very high um, and where there's a lack of air conditioning, there's a lack of um, opportunities to cool if it's a heat wave and so on. So I think that there's probably a parallel in this. Maybe not exactly, but there, there would be. You can see, I can see some of the neighborhoods, even the ones over there. Thorncliffe Park is here. Whoops. Um, this is Thorncliffe, right? I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but you can see that. That's Thorncliffe. Okay. So it's just an example of something the city is doing. They're mapping out areas of vulnerability and they make an effort during heat waves to go and check on vulnerable uh, populations. Um, this was in the news. I just put this in there as an example. Um, so what is the city doing in terms of uh, building buildings or regulating the, the, the built form? Uh, well, we have this tool, this important tool. Um, I helped to work on this uh, in the ecology section. It's called the Toronto Green Standard and V3 stands for version three. This is the third iteration of this document. Um, it basically, um, defines what a green building is in the city of Toronto. And so a, a, a development application has to um, confirm through the site plan process that they have met everything that's required of the green standard. So that's one way that the city is, is, uh, is, is addressing the issue of buildings and making them more sustainable. Now this deals with new buildings only, not existing. So the city doesn't have jurisdiction over that. That would be a provincial matter. Um, and so, Perhaps the building code could be used. It's being um, revised currently. Um, a new version of it's coming out, I think, relatively soon, and there will be a process to begin revising that one uh, shortly. Comes out around every five years or so. 
So we're also trying to increase the tree canopy, tree planting uh, initiatives, um, urban naturalization. This is St. George Street at, e at U of T. You can see it's got a lot of greenery there. It's very, um, in a few years, this is a few years ago, but even now it's, it's the canopy's filling in and it's looking, it looks really, really beautiful. It provides shade, places to sit and rest and so on if it's really hot and also absorb rainwater. So there's more green space where the water can go. This is permeable pavement and so, and so on. Um, another thing that uh, you guys are familiar with, I'm sure, uh, sustainable sidewalks. Civicel's very long tree pits where trees can be planted, where their, where their branches, uh, where their, sorry, where their roots can spread out. You can see these along Bayview, um, along the east side of Bayview for sure. Those um, long tree pits that look like they're all, um, it looks like they're a different material than the sidewalk that's permeable. So if you pour water on it, it'll go through and it allows for water to collect and provide water for the tree to uh, sustain itself over uh, um, periods of time where it may be drier. Uh, over the summer and so on, which will result in a healthier tree, which over time results in a nicer tree canopy and a better quality of life. And, you know, the east side of Bayview in the afternoon to today is, uh, is very, very hot on the summer day. And um, uh, in a few years, though, when these trees start to mature and the canopy fills out, it's going to be a really beautiful stretch uh, due to the shade it provides and so on. Okay, so in terms of uh, uh, those those uh, backflow uh, your your uh, basement flooding city has a has a program to install backflow valves which will uh, stop uh, the flow of um, uh, water reverse flow of of if you want to call it water into your basement it'll automatically stop it and it'll um, provide a barrier which will stop it from leaking into your into your home so there's a program to help uh, residents install these in, in, in their in their basements in their homes if they if they wish uh, we're also working uh, on sustainable parking lots this is again permeable paving so it allows for the water to to go through it instead of flow over and into a small area a small drain pipe or so on so it filters into the ground which helps reduce the pressure on the gray infrastructure the pipes that are underneath the ground and this allows for the ground to soak up water and do what it would naturally do anyway, right? Okay. Um, we've been doing some mapping, which is quite interesting, um, showing hot zones in the city. Uh, you can see that this is, if you look at this thermal mapping, you can see there's a hot spot and a cool spot. It's related very obviously, I think you guys would all guess, it's like two buildings and then green space would be the cool spot. And so we have uh, green roof incentive programs to help uh, uh, building owners install green roofs. It's not feasible on all types of buildings, but we certainly um, encourage it where it can be done. And we help, uh, we help pay for that. Um, and uh, there's programs to help get that, get that done. And what it does, it provides uh, shade, it cools the building, insulates it in the winter, it cools it in the summer, insulates it in better in the, in the winter. It also provides some habitat for for different species, pollinators, birds even, so on. Who knows what's living up there and, and so on. So there's a lot of positives to green roofs that the city is encouraging. And basically, um, that's my presentation. This is an article I, um, I uh, was recommending to my students to read just for debate, for a matter of debate so that we, we could debate whether, whether or not we can actually do something about it. And uh, so this is an article in the, in, the New York, in the New Yorker, which I thought was quite good. So this, this um, uh, Franzen is arguing that, you know, um, it's coming no matter what we do. We need, to, we, we need to admit that we can't stop it. And so that's how we have to deal with it. But that's, uh, that's not um, everyone's perspective, but it's one that it's good for classroom discussion. And so I think that's, that's next week, guys, we have our midterm. And so I hope you all were listening. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, that, so that's it. Uh, I'll, I can stop sharing now. Um, how do I? Okay, here we go. Stop share. Perfect.
Well, that's amazing. That was great. I mean, let me just uh, take you off spotlight so we can see other people. And one second. There we go. And I'm sure people have questions because, uh, oh, that was amazing, Kelly. Wow. Two lots of uh, food for thought. So, uh, Susan, do you mind what we start with Susan and then we'll try to keep an eye on who, who's wanting? I okay, find it you, interesting Susan. that you're, you're showing us this right when um, there was this huge <laughs> building boom especially on Bayview and all over and our premier is is like gung-ho we need these all these huge huge buildings is there I don't know do you think they really understand this what the impact is um well I'm gonna speak uh I'm not a city employee <laughs> at this moment um well I am but uh, I'm not wearing my city employee hat or or uh, I would say that um it almost becomes ideological at a certain point. Certain parties will accept it more and certain parties are pandering to um, interests in the economy or society that are necessarily as not, not as sensitive or, or as accepting of this issue. And so you can see that um, they're talking about building a 400 series highway, um, developing parts of the green belt and so on. Um, but you know, it's not, they're not entirely bad. They're just like mostly bad. <laughs> Me and my, but anyway, I don't know if they get it. Yeah. I know that some parties get it more. So I noticed that they're building a, a massive, I think they're sewer, sewer pipes, if I'm not mistaken, flood, floodwater pipes in the Don Valley right now. And I, um, and if they say you could, you could literally drive a Mack truck in the middle of it. And is that to expedite and uh, anticipate some of what we just saw in that other picture? Or what, 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 what's it, I've been following some of it. What, did you have an in, insight on that or? Um, where were those pipes? In the Don, Don River Valley, are there uh, massive amounts near the bridge of, um, let me think. It, the, it's, it's near the Blue, Blue Viaduct, but also Viaduct, just Queen, to the north of it, uh, beside yeah. Bayview Avenue. And also in the Queen Street uh, Bridge, and also in the yeah. East and West Riverdale Park, uh, you'll notice massive pipes. They're 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 sinking in the ground, and and it says uh, I think it says stormwater uh, plan for the city of Toronto. Have yeah, the the city has something called the Wet Weather Flow Master Management Plan. That that's it. Yes, and yes. um and it's a, it's basically a hundred year plan to deal with um, how we refurbish. It goes in 25 year increments. I think they're in the still in the first 20 first increment, right. um, but it's basically meant to because the city was built um, without these types of sorry, I'm it looks so dark. I don't know how to fix that. Looks like I'm just a shadow talking. <laughs> um, That's better. That's better. Okay. Yeah. So the city was built with obviously very well, old technology, like the basic downtown parts of it, and, and much of the, 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 the infrastructure in the 50s and 60s were, was not meant to, uh, to deal with these types of even populations. And, and then, of course, now we have these weather events. So they're, they're, um, they, they're probably upgrading sewer sanitary and stormwater mains in those areas it could also if the ones in the dawn valley those could also be possibly be part of uh, um the renaturalization of the mouth of the dawn um which is in a, an attempt to take out the keating channel and um let the dawn sort of renaturalize down there um yeah i would think that 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 would be a couple of the options that those were being used for. You know, back in the day um, when they were building a lot of this infrastructure, yes. they didn't necessarily build it under roads, they built it in the ravine systems. And so, right. um, like for instance, in Tay Taylor Massey Creek, there's a, a really, really old sanitary sewer um, pipe that, you know, these things wear out after a while. And so you it's kind of a shame because you have to take heavy machinery down into the ravine into the water almost and dig it up and repair the pipes, right? So um, they don't do that anymore. 
um, but uh, you know they, they'll use underneath roads and stuff. But uh, but there is there is a lot that needs to be addressed underneath those in with the within the ravine system. So that could also be an option of what could be occurring in the Don Valley. I don't see anybody else with their hand, but I have a couple more. Uh, what, so we, we know that in Toronto, they built over a lot of rivers, generally next to, and so uh, when you think of, I know the Christie Pits, that area there, uh, Cudmore Creek in the, with right near Manor Road, Tattle Creek in the downtown, there was a pond beside Philosopher's Walk, and, 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 and as you talk about all this flooding, so that, that causes problems, and also we, we, we sort of have, a, have an idea that we used to have a lot of exposed earth at one time, and we put cement on that earth. And then hence, uh, it, it doesn't take a probably a climate scientist to realize that we took something that was permeable, and we made it semi impermeable, and hence more what, what, what's your what's your comment? Or do, should we uncover all the rivers? I'm not sure what that would how we would. Well, ever I, do. Yeah, that's that discussions been had, I think I don't think it's really feasible. I mean, right. they've, they've tried to acknowledge the existence of the um, of the rivers by placing like public art. Right. I don't know last time you were down at Trinity Bellwoods, but there's um, a blue uh, colored. I don't, I don't know if you call it tilings, but it's like yeah. a blue they're tight. I guess there are tiles mm -hmm. within the sidewalk. Right. So it's which it's the used to show its root. That might be Garrison Creek, I think. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, they're underneath there. And uh, I don't see them coming up anytime soon. Maybe maybe portions of them. Right. But I don't see them. Like, they call it daylighting. I don't think they're going to daylight that right. anytime soon. I saw Joan Bigley with her hand up. Joan, what's your yeah. question? Um, two, actually, um, two things. Uh, Kelly, I think there's a book called The Lost Rivers. Yeah, there uh, is. And, and it's great. It and, and it outlines sort of like by area of all the lost rivers from like Parliament and Sherburne of where they are. And it yeah. sort of, as you said, there's signage outlining them. And when you do the discovery trails and all that, yeah. they do another set of paths just to show where those lost rivers have been. Yeah. Um, so just to comment on that. And the other question I was going to ask you is, like, for all the condos that are being built, like, there's going to be three in, in my area at Davisville, Mount Pleasant coming up. Then do they look at um, green space, that, that kind of thing that you're talking about to, to compensate for the amount of land development that occurs? Like, is there a ratio percentage for every condo to... Yeah. To, yeah, yeah. Um, there's okay. If I understand correctly, um, I'll give you two things. Um, there's the building itself, the, the site itself, and they the city will look at the um, the design of the site and the proposal for the site. And um, first of all, the building will have to meet the Toronto Green Standard, so it's going to be much more sustainable um, today at, than it would be, say. 12 years ago or 15 years ago. So those buildings are going to be themselves the build the building will be more sustainable. And then there's around the site, there's requirements for green space and, and landscaping and so on through the zoning and through TGS. Um, depending on the scale and the size of the development, parks gets involved at a certain point at a certain square meter of size. And it sounds like they would be involved in the ones you're describing. And what they do is they calculate, they do a calculation and they say, well, you need to either provide, and the options are to provide parkland uh, within the site or close by or somewhere, uh, you know, within the vicinity, or they give something called cash in lieu. And that cash goes into a fund that Parks has control of that does um, improvements, expands, can sometimes, can even purchase property to add to parks and so on. So that's the process that it, that it goes through. Um, they, I think the example of there's was an improvement um, to that park on Moore. I don't know what the, the, you know, where you just get past Mud Creek and you're almost to Mount Pleasant and it's on, it's on the south side. And they recently put in a, a really nice splash pad and 
and fencing around it. It's, they really improved it. And so I would think, I would imagine that that's something, that's a, that would be another method. And that would have come out of something called Section 37. Mm. And so that's in the Planning Act. And so that allows the city to calculate um, uh, a percentage of what um, we call community benefits that the developer is required to pay uh, in order to um, help mitigate the increased pressure on the services and parks and every, libraries, community centers and so on, the increased pressure that the population that they're going to be providing homes for will bring. Does that make sense? Like the more people that live close to that park, the more yeah, no, the more people will use it. Yeah, yeah and so no, that's one way. That's one way we improve the parks. Yeah. And then, as far as dedicating parkland, it's sometimes they do it on the site because sometimes a part of the site isn't usable, like in terms of the building, um, but they still own that portion. And sometimes parks will, you know, they take that over or they'll require certain types of, you know, maybe there'll be a privately owned what we call a privately owned public space where it's privately maintained and owned, but the public can go there and have lunch or whatever. It would be almost indiscernible uh, from a regular park, except the, the sign wouldn't be there that, you know, the little signs they have for, for a park. Um, so I, I, does that help answer? Yeah. It does, it gives me more insight. Thank you. Yeah. So and often there'll be uh notices sent out to if it's if you're within a certain distance of the proposed development you can always go and then it's, that's always a good question to ask you well, know I at think, a community meeting yeah and i think that's the next time like when josh matlow or whoever the councillor is and has the town hall meetings now it's giving me something more to uh, be more educated about when asking well, Josh is amazing. Like, yeah, he is. Like, I think he's a fantastic counselor. And uh, yeah. well, he's sort of a friend as well. Like he's lectured at my class before. He's come to Manor Road a couple of times. Yes, he yes. has. Um, but yeah, sure. so I would, if that's within his ward, then I would be up to Josh to, to, to get yeah. that, to get that built. I'm not sure if that park is in his ward though. I don't know. But like I said, it gives me just more insight in general when I'm looking now. Yeah. Thank you. So, so another question is when, when you think of the common pattern of building condos nowadays seems to be to build a three or four story pedestal and then a taller tower. Now, I'm not a, an engineer and architect expert, but one could think instead of building a patio for the condo people, which, which essentially was what they do, they build these cement, horizontal cement pads with barbecues and whatnot. Now, they could build, I mean, that there could be a space for people but they don't, they don't seem to be, there's not a drive to make that green space. Like you don't see uh, a perennial, uh, something beyond a lawn, or even you could have woolly time or something like that. Uh, what do you think is, I mean, I know the developers wouldn't really want to do that, but what's preventing the city from mandating that to your thought? Or is well, it not on their radar? Yeah. No, no, we've actually mandated that. Okay. Uh, we, we asked for a podium. It's right. a couple of different things. That's there a couple, podium. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a couple of different things that come into play there. So you don't want to screen the streetscape when you're, um, you know, walking along it. You don't want it to be too imposing. Oh. So you, you have a podium because the building's essentially going to, let's say it's 50 stories tall. To have a 50 story building right bumping up against the street, which you can see in, in downtown, or you can see in many American cities. Um, like there's like a, the Empire State, State Building, there's no podium and it's straight no, up no. right there, right? And so um, we require a podium and then it steps back and it gives one a sense that it, you're not being um, imposed on. And so it also, as you said, provides some amenity space up there for the, the dwellers of that tower. And then you concentrate the tower. There's actually tower separation distances that are required, podium separation distances. But um, I mean, there's setbacks that, that do allow, that do um, um, require uh, areas that could be used as green space. But, um, you know, it gets a little complicated. Like this one over at, um, I guess you'd call it Hillsdale and Bayview, um, between Hillsdale and, uh, and uh, what's that one? It's right here. Uh, it's Sudan. Sudan. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, that one there, it's going to have retail at, at grade. Right. So there's no real opportunity to really green it in front. Um, but they're going to have retail, which will, you know, hopefully be successful in liven up that part of Bayview and so on. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah. Uh, yeah. So the city does require that there's a podium, a tower, and uh, it's meant to not be so imposing. And then it also has issues related to, um, uh, to wind. Right, right. Now, these big tall towers, if you just um, build a big tall tower, the wind hits the tower and goes straight down the tower and right. into the sidewalk. Right. And it creates an environment that is very unpleasant. So the, the t now the wind will hit the tower and shoot down and hit the top of the podium. And it doesn't right. get to this. So in a, in a storm, you know, windy day, the street isn't like it becomes like a hurricane down there right? Right. if yeah. it's straight up and down, you know, right. so that, that's why another reason why we require that. Now, not to monopolize questions, Debbie, you haven't asked a question. I'm, you're, you're, you're always like me, a million questions. No, no thoughts coming to mind? No, no, not. Well, you know, I mean, well, it's like I put in the comments, you know, yeah. with Black Creek. I mean, just heavy rainfall and it becomes like a raging river. So I'm not really sure where it flows into, maybe into the Humber? I think so. Yeah. yeah? Okay, because you sort of lose the trail of it um, once you get to Shepherd. So it must be all underground. I wonder. That's a, that's yeah. a good question. I see, I see Judy Gasper wants a question. Judy. Yeah, hi. Um, hi Sunnybrook Plaza, that, there's a river that goes along the north side of Eglinton under Dominion, oh, sorry, Metro. Metro. And there's some word that Sunnybrook Plaza, when they rebuild it, they're gonna have trouble with the underground water. Do you have any idea? Well, I don't know about that river. I think, I don't doubt it at all because there's lots of ravines and I guess it would just flow down to the that's the west on over there right no problem. um yeah although I do know that that application was submitted many years ago like several years ago and it's totally stalled so maybe there's like environmental like maybe there's some real challenges to the to the rebuild because that's I think that plaza is the first car plaza like that in all of toronto right. it's it's the first it's 75 years the first strip plaza that was built and when i was a kid yeah. i sang a song on on bing whittaker's club <laughs> in front of in that plaza i've never forgotten and i was so sad to see it being ripped down yeah, yeah you know it's just uh, like talking about that plaza the heritage um planners they were trying like crazy to come up with a way to save it but they couldn't because like it's it's hard to do a plaza like that in terms of the criteria for heritage buildings because they right. change the, the tenants change so much right. so it's not like the oh the hudson's bay has been there for 150 years or whatever it is you know how right. long there so it's 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 challenging to to find that because you know they have all kinds of stores over there but um yeah I live right across the street from it, basically. So, Kelly, you started with a very interesting piece about the melting of the Greenland ice. And, I mean, that brings us to the macro level. Uh, the question I might ask is, so what is that, the melting of the ice, not only the, the uh, Greenland ice, but the other ice, do the salinity, salinity of the, the water, and how does that uh, what impact on climate and, I guess, currents and, and other bits? Is there a short answer, long answer? <laughs> well, I think it's a long answer, but I don't necessarily have it. I know that that is a concern for uh, okay. you know climate scientists. I know that um, if you were to take all the all the ice sheets and melt them, yes. it would certainly have an effect on the salinity of the water, which would right. affect currents and right. who knows tides. I, I'm not sure exactly, but it's a serious question. Like it's, I'm not, I wasn't trying to suggest that the entire sheet had melted. It's just that the top of it. Right. It's slushy or soggy, right? right? And so right. you, you know, it's starting to, to melt. And um, the images that I've seen from Greenland, uh, some of them are like, it's like a huge temporary river coming out of the bottom of these glaciers, right? right. right. Pouring into the ocean. So 
it's a, it's serious business, but I don't necessarily have a good answer. Okay, well, we're having the same issue with our Arctic. Yeah, no, well, it's part of- it's, I mean, and look at all the discoveries they're making in Alberta, yes. in the mountains with the uh, ice cap melting. So Kelly, what can we do locally? I mean, you mentioned talking to Josh Matlow, perhaps Jay Robinson, that's the municipal level, but I guess, I mean, that's probably, I think, think globally, act locally. Um, um, well, okay. I talk to my students uh, about this um, because that's the huge question because right. the, the climate change seems like an absolutely overwhelming mm -hmm. challenge. We're not right? all glad. We're not all Greta. I mean, and, <laughs> no, but uh, the thing is that it can't happen unless everyone does something and governments right. do something. And so like, yeah. what can you do? I mean, it's hard to it's hard to say. I mean, um, you can reduce the amount of uh, impermeable surfaces on your property. I guess you could put rain barrels out, collect the water. You know, as long as they're carefully, as long as they don't breed mosquitoes. Um, you could so you can reuse rainwater. You can store it like if it sits in place, it's it's safer um, in terms of damaging the the infrastructure. You know. I think it's all pretty intuitive, but probably, I think that like knowing everyone at, at Manor Road and so on, I, I can imagine that, that like I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> so, um, pardon the pun, I guess, but I, it's just, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It's like hard to say. I think that, you know, individual choices are matter, right? But so do governments. And so, you know, you could pressure politicians, like you said, and, and talk to them about it let them know that you're concerned about that you know and so on it's hard though i mean you can hear for a while there climate change dropped off the map right for the first like almost year i think but it's coming back a bit now in terms of news stories because the pandemic consumed everything and now it's sort of like it now climate change is coming back uh, but i kind of i like to hear um uh the government talk about reorganizing the economy in a green but i mean to me it always seems these dates are so far away but whatever. isn't some of this climate change natural phenomenon well i, mean, I think yeah i think certainly like, i mean how many ice ages has the world been through no that's absolutely true they also go through global warming you but know it's, every yeah i think the difference is that you know, if a climate scientist would answer you by saying it's the speed at which it's happening and it's okay. the cause, it's the cause. So you're right. Absolutely. There have been ice ages because we know this and mm -hmm. it's, there's been several, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is that um, the speed at which it occurs, I think is the difference and the cause it's all anthropocentric. It's all human caused all of these reasons like the release of fossil fuels. So, you know, if a meteorite, in, if there are no humans and a meteorite came and hit the earth and caused um, a global ice age, well, that would be something different, you know, a different cause. <laughs> the thing yeah. is, we can control this cause is what the argument is. And so at least we can control it. I don't think we can stop it anymore, but it seems that we can control it. And, mm. you know, it's kind of important to think of it like that. Maybe reduce, reduce the speed of it, I guess. Yeah. I think that's it, reducing the speed, adapting. You know, I mean, electric cars are gonna have a big impact and, and, and all the way we build our buildings, we'll see if we get retroactive in terms of retrofitting buildings to make them more sustainable or more or greener designed and so on. But, uh, you know, who knows? I mean, but I'm sure, I think I'm, I know people who are completely cynical about it and then people who are totally optimistic. I, I would think I'm somewhere in the middle. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm hopeful because I've got, you know, little ones, but uh, no, I mean, I don't know. It seems like I think things will come around, I'm hoping, um, mm -hmm. but it's the speed at which it happens. It's, it's remarkable how quickly we change the climate if you really think about it. Mm -hmm. It's like a couple generations, maybe three, right? I don't know. Well, to, to your point, there was that noted because we weren't driving our cars, the visibility in many of the global cities was remarkable. Yeah. And I think there were there and there were the animals because we weren't even on the streets. They were coming out. 
Yeah. And the, I think there were dolphins were someplace, and there were deer on the the, uh, the the beach area and other areas too. And uh, yeah, there's been some um, you know benefits to it. I think there's more birds this year for some reason. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I'm just oh, maybe really? imagining. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think I'm just imagining it. I'll go out and walk around and stuff. And in the mornings, Talbot Park is just alive with. Yes. Hundreds of birds. It's just incredible. But, I've, um, noticed, I've noticed more rabbits than normal. Yeah. I saw a groundhog the other day. Really? Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I mean, I've never seen a groundhog in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I should say, guys, I, I have to run in a couple of minutes. Well, um, it's been amazing, Kelly. It's remarkable. We were, we were talking about your, your tool library talk a couple of months ago and have talked <laughs> a bit more about that one, hopefully, once we open yeah. up. It's been yeah. fascinating. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Fascinating. Thank you. Well, it's really nice to see you guys. Well, thank you. Susan, do you want to bid us adieu and tell us about what's next week? And uh, yeah. you're the one who knows what's next week. <laughs> okay. So so we have uh, actually Debbie Danbrook who's coming to share with us about Beltane and walking the labyrinth. So uh, we've had Kelly uh, Debbie before. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, Kelly, if you've run into Debbie Danbrook. She just lives on Bayview as well, near Moore. She plays mm -hmm. the uh, the Shakuhachi the bamboo flute yeah so, so thank you again kelly and yep. thank you again everyone and uh do do have get, get outside when it's not raining or even when it's raining. it's always good too and have a good rest of the day take care everybody thank you everybody okay guys